good evening everyone uh, today is the third session of our lecture series on um, uh, for this uh, for this year and today uh, our past chairman uh, engineer mrs kamala kamala gunawardena uh, madam has uh, joined with us uh, actually uh, she initiated this lecture series uh, two years back with uh, professor isanjay singh and also our current chairman uh, engineer mangal silva is also there uh, over to you madam Thank you, Engineer Vanduka. Invited me to welcome the gathering. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, we can. We can. Yeah. We can hear you. Actually, this is uh, this is really an interesting uh, forum for me uh, because I have been I have been working with this for uh, last two sessions. So I really enjoy this uh, working with this team. So. Uh, this is after several gaps, actually, I couldn't continue for the last two lessons. So I welcome first and foremost our resource person. Today, the well-known personality who needs no introduction and no need to say many things about our veteran and the distinguished professor, Tishan Jai Singer, Senior Professor of Civil Engineering at the University of Morotua. So I, I welcome you, sir, uh, yeah. Professor Tishan Jai Singer. Also, let me welcome every one of you who has joined uh, this lecture very anxiously. I, I can see a good number. So welcome every one of you for the le lecture. Actually, let me let me just give a small note about what I like to say. Uh, this was actually your services, Professor, you contributed for as a resource person for two sessions, uh, last previous two sessions. Uh, it was actually really good stuff under the lecture series structural design of highway bridges uh, uh, previous session and apart from that uh, for the previous one you did uh, about 20 lectures on highway high rise buildings using your reports online and actually it was winding up was a very physical effective event and it was so interesting and people are commending a lot so with that uh, uh, I think we are going to uh, wide the session recent advantages advances or in rich design technologies with Eurocode cried criteria with the last session, the last physical session. So that was very commendable, what I would like to say again. So uh, it's a some it's a small brief uh, with a very, very enthusiastic i i give this message to our members because i would like to request these members also to keep your momentum and make a good rhythm so this um, lecture series would be a very very interesting and a very effective one at the end of the session i think you all will be completing your uh, very beautiful number i mean remarkable number about like 80 percent or 90 percent of your attendance so it would be a it would be a very important thing end of the session so, Professor, I appreciate your commitment to undertake this series of lectures. And I can remember you. your willingness to conduct, I think, maybe around 28, 28 or something for this session as well, right? Yeah, so, in that, lectures. I invite Professor to comment the lecture on structural <laughs> design of cost-effective lightweight hybrid multi-story buildings using your report number three. I'm correct, no? No, two. Your report two, please. Uh, you record to uh, correction. Thank you. I greatly appreciate your acceptance for this session uh, under the chairmanship of uh, our uh, dynamic engineer, Engineer Mangal Silva. So he's around today. So we are starting the today's event right now. And it's uh, it's an honor for me to do this uh, instigating note, actually. So over to you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, madam. Uh, Professor, I'm also thank here, you. so please continue. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, okay, Mangala. Now, uh, uh, you all, uh, you can, you all can see uh, the sheet, right? Yeah, here. We can see, sir. Yeah, yeah. Just give me one, uh, one second until I open. Uh, yeah. Now it's all done. Right. Whatever extra we need, we will open later. Today we are going to talk about. Can you all hear me properly? Yes, sir. We can yes, hear sir. you. Yeah, we can hear. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So today we are going to start talking about <coughs> use of 
reinforce compound theory. Because last two sessions we talked about how to make concrete. Now today we are going to talk about how to use reinforce concrete. So what is the first thing? The first thing, the fundamental. Now we are inserting steel in concrete. Now what is the reason for this, these two to behave together? The important thing is coefficient of thermal expansion of steel is concrete is about 10 into 10 to the power minus 6. Steel it's about 12 into 10 to the power minus 6. So the the coefficient of expansion are more or less the same. The coefficient of the coefficient of expansion, the values are more or less the same. So that's why we can use a, a material called reinforced concrete. So that's a very important thing. Then. Uh, so today is uh, 13th, 2023, Civil Engineering Sectional Committee uh, Lecture 3, page 1. Page. So that's the first thing you have to keep in mind. They are having a similar coefficient of thermal expansion. Because of that reason, we can... Uh, we can uh, use uh, concrete and reinforcement to be. Now let's look at uh, what we know, what all of you know. That is BS8110 stress, stress blocks. So that is part one. I will use 1985 because uh, 1997 code is only a minor variation. So it's very easy to talk in terms of 1985 code, and anyway, we are not going to use it, so I'll, I'll use the earlier one. Stress strain curve for co concrete goes like that, and in the maximum strain allowed is 3.6. This is very important, very important, one. and here elastic. And then it goes into plastic. And uh, here we have a magic number. And uh, so we have to see what is the magic number that we get here. So what we do is we test the Q. British standard, we test the Q. This 150 millimeter, 150 and 150. And how do we test it? We test it between two steel platens, the thick steel plates, what you call steel platens. So what happens is when you are applying the load, when you apply sigma, what happens is you get new times sigma. Yeah. That is the Poisson's, Poisson's ratio. So with that, what you get is there will be micro cracks forming, and finally, the cube should break like this after the formation of micro cracks. Is it clear, Mangala? Yes, sir. It's all clear. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So then, what happens is now these uh, plates, because this height is only 150. The side is only 150. These plates will restrain this concrete. So finally, we say stress is equal to force divided by A. So the stress that you calculate this way, when you say a 20 megapascal concrete, so 25 or 30 megapascal concrete, We'll use 30 megapascal because it's now many people, many engineers use 30 megapascal. Uh, the reason is it gives a better durability, and I explain you how to improve it even further by using fly ash earlier. Right. 
So what happens is we use 30 megapascal. Then the actual strength of concrete, here you have 30. The actual strength of concrete is 30 multiplied by 0 0.8. 30 multiplied by 0 0.8. Then, then the other thing is we are testing the steel, the, the concrete in compression, but when you are using, we are using it in flexion. So, to, so here you get compression, and this compression is flexure, caused by flexure. M O I is equal to sigma O I type of thing initial, but in reinforced concrete. The behavior is different because we say below the neutral axis, concrete is cracked. So because of that reason, we get this and this. And if you because uh, con the, if you look at the stress strain curve going like this, so what happens is gradually it will become like this. And we say rectangular parabolic. And in uh, BA standards, we said this is equal to rectangular with a depth of 0.9x. So that's what uh, we, we said in the British standards. So these numbers. So I'm going to a new page now. This civil engineering section committee. Lecture three. Page number two. Is there any question you'd like to ask here? This is a simple theory. Mm -hmm. So we say, because we are using like this, the actual stress is 0.84 times the actual uh, strength. 30 multiplied by 0.8. So you can multiply 0.85 and 0.8 together. Point, multiply 0 0.8, pi and 0.8. Then you multiply 0.85 by 0.8. What is the answer? 0.67. So we say, 68, we say the strength of concrete here in the stress strain curve is 0 0.67 times FCU, cube strength, FCU. So if I mark here, this value will be 0 0.67 times FCU. So that's how you get 0.67. Then what it says, the, the partial factor of safety for material strength of concrete is 1.5. So divided by 1.5, then you get 0.45 So if you are designing a column, uh, although we say column is uh, maybe axially loaded, although we say the column may be axially loaded, so this civil engineering sectional committee lecture three, right? So if you say although the column is axially loaded, they can be there will be a minimum moment that you have to consider due to 0.5%, sorry, due to 5% excess of the load. So because of that, we say the load carrying capacity N of a column is 0.45 times FCU. Now you know how you get 0.45 times FCU, that is 0.67 times FCU divided by 1.5 multiplied by area of concrete. So the load carrying capacity of a column is 0.45 times FCU multiplied by AC. But we can't construct a column without any reinforcement. The reason is, uh, you know, there can be cracks. Due to thermal movement and all other restraints, there can be cracks. So we are supposed to provide a minimum percent of percentage of reinforcement, 0.4%. So we say whatever the percentage, the area of reinforcement is. Then we have to make sure we take into account 
what the steel can carry. That is Fy A S. The area of steel in compression. So we can say A C. Area of steel in compression. And uh, Fy, why we get 0.87 is the reinforcement can be either in compression or tension. And the because it's manufactured under factory conditions, we divide by 1.15 factor of safety. And you get 0.87 times. So steel, whatever the strength specified by the factory is the strength. But we had to we had to have some factor of safety. We have a small factor of safety, 1.15. So now you can see. Now we must get this strength. And how are we going to get that strength? What we do is we have to cure the concrete. Once you pour concrete, the strength is zero. After one day, you get 10% of the strength so that we can remove the shutters. What many people do in Sri Lanka, after that, they think uh, now it's, it's hard, nothing to worry. They don't cure sufficient. Very few people pay enough attention. But I showed you why curing is important because we have to continue this strength development process, number one. Secondly, when you cure, there will be a lot of hydration taking place in the cover zone and we'll end up with the cover without voids because calcium hydroxide generated will have a higher volume than the original cement particles. So the, all these materials that are reacting will have some higher volume, but they are not hard materials. So the, whatever the spaces available will be occupied by whatever these uh, extra materials. And that way, concrete can become denser. Dense concrete will not carbonate easily. And you can get a structure lasting a long time once you cure it. On one side, it will be strong. On the other side, it will be durable. So when you are using reinforced concrete, make sure minimum of seven days of curing is essential. I mean, if you can do a little more, it's even better. By at least keep it moist. But keeping it extremely moist for seven days is essential. But uh, in many sites in Sri Lanka, we can't see this type of uh, attention paid to the paid to cure. Banduko, uh, what's your suggestion, or Mangala? What do you think? Yes. I mean, yes, sir. it's not easy to. Huh? Hello, sir. It is, yeah, it is not easy to persuade people to continue curing for seven days. Very yeah, difficult. yeah, it's very difficult, sir. Yeah, but what they have to understand because you know all our calculations are correct. Not at the 20% or 30 percent strength. Our calculations will be correct. If we cure it and achieve the desirable strength, and for that, the modern cement needs about seven days of curing. Modern cements need about seven days of curing. That's why we are proposing that we use at least 10 to 20% fly ash. Minimum of 10% fly ash will make sure there's enough material in it. So whatever the calcium hydroxide is produced, the, the, the reactions can take place later, gradually, where the fly ash starts reacting with whatever the calcium hydroxide produced as a result of curing process. So if you look at the attitude of the people, and I was looking at uh, Hilton Hotel recently, which was built over 40 years ago. The specification said, cure the concrete for one month. Cure the concrete for one month. So after 40 years, we looked at the carbonation. Carbonation is very small. The maximum carbonation after 40 years of existence was 10 millimeters. Some places it's even two, three millimeters. Why? Because they have this is Japanese construction. And when they say we cure for one month, they cure for one month. They will not try to find shortcuts. 
And they never use curing compound. They used water, cured the structure. Now, four years afterwards, we took course. We could not take course, but fortunately, for some other repair work, they had to drill through the slabs. So we used those samples, checked for carbonation, and we found some places the carbonation can be only one millimeter or less. Whereas some places the carbonation maximum could be about 10 minutes. So what do you think about that kind of research? And you can see the strength, you know, the importance of carbonation. So the importance of uh, curing in reducing the carbonation. So I'm sure if we uh, take, if you are allowed to take more samples, you would have found the average carbonation, that is penetration of the low pH regime into the concrete due to carbon dioxide penetration or absorption, it would be in the range of three to five millimeters, which means a well-constructed structure like Hilton Hotel will have a lifespan maybe in the range of 150 to 200 years. But uh, based on our limited resource, we, we said without any fear, it can it will have a trouble free service for another thirty five years because for any investor thirty five years is a long enough period to make decisions so whether to invest or not so but uh, my gut feeling is this hotel will not have any issue if looked after properly with the adequate waterproofing on the exposed areas. The lifespan of this hotel, because most of the places it's all uh, it's all covered, no no adverse uh, effect except the carbonation. This hotel can easily last 150 to 200 years. That's the way we have to do construction. But unfortunately, what we see today is uh, recently we have visited one school building, uh, maybe 15 years old. But already columns have started deterioration. One is poor quality concrete without with very little aggregates. Second, the they are not cured. They are cured everything else except the columns. Whereas we have to understand column is the key parameter or key key element in a building, and column is the one that is heavily loaded. So it has a small cross section and a heavy load. We must pay a lot of attention to columns. And I'm going to show you why columns, poorly constructed columns are standing. But uh, that, is not a, that is not a good way of uh, constructing. Curing must be paid a lot of attention. And I have seen young engineers are also responsible. They are reluctant to implement curing adequately. Even if the it's, it's a uphill battle in the industry to cure concrete, but it should not be the case. We should be we should be fully aware. Curing is uh, important. Is there any problem? Um, uh, no, any, uh, no, sir. Video, I think. Uh, we so I didn't write one... uh, anything for a uh, longer period, so uh, it's like not working the video. I think it is not like that. No, no, it's working. You can see? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah it's working, right? Right, okay. So basically, I was talking a bit because uh, because this is very important. Because we have to change the attitude of the engineers as well. Uh, but uh, fortunately, in the modern concrete, if you add about 10% fly ash, uh, with seven days of curing, we can achieve very significant level of uh, expected strength. Right. So now, now we have a simple equation. So what is the equation? N is equal to this 0.45 FCU plus AC plus 0.87 FI AC. And then we say, if you are going to use this equation, don't use it that way. Reduce the capacity by 10%. So that means you get 0.4 FCU AC plus 
point seven five f y a c. And then, if you are going to design a column, considering that uh, there will be a moment, but the spans on either side on the column are having a similar values, so the maximum variation is 50-15%, then you don't have to do anything. You can simply design the column by using Don't do any calculation. N is equal to 0.35 FCU AC plus 0.67 FI AC. So if the moments are going to be small, just write, write one equation. And that equation is a 10% reduction. So N is equal to 0.35 FCU AC plus 0.67 FY AC. That is ceiling. So, what you have to do is take the column, find the steel area. Steel area is concrete area AC is equal to A multiplied by AC. So, if you, can, if you want, you can substitute that way. Otherwise, some people just ignore it because already we have. Reduce and the steel ratio will be about 0.4 to 1 percent. Right. So, in a column, what is the amount of steel we have to produce? Well, we have to product. What is the amount of steel we have to produce? For provide. The amount of steel is 0.4 percent. If the column is rightly loaded, So in a two-story, three-story, four-story building, you can draw it one percent, four point four percent. But if it's a tall building, we re it's it's we can't say it's a light load, it's heavily loaded. Then you have to provide one percent. So any 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 column that you suspect that it is heavily loaded, you have to use one percent. So that is why when you are doing the piles. We know piles are very lightly loaded, so we can provide about 0.7 percent, even 0.6 percent might do, because what is needed minimum is 0.5 percent, right? So in a pile, the minimum need is 0.5 percent. You can provide anything about that. So in Sri Lanka, often we provide 0.7 to 0.8 percent, 0.7 to 0.8 percent. So. Uh, now you can see why we have these values. The pile has a massive area, and under working stresses, we say the stress on concrete is 0.25 times FCU. So it is lightly loaded, 0.25 times FCU. So the pile needs only about 0.5 percent reinforcement. But to be on the safe side. And also to make sure the reinforcement cage is sub sufficiently strong. Generally, many engineers like to use about 0.7% reinforcement, but even if you drop it to 0.6%, it's not going to be uh, any problem. But then you might ask, oh, what is going to happen due to earthquakes? So, in the earthquake, what matters is not the Longitudinal reinforcement, what matters is the spiral. So in an in a pile with the pile cap, where the hinge hinge occurs, hinge occurs here. So in this area, you have to have confinement. So start seeing here, you have to have confinement. So generally it's a good thing to have T10 at a hundred centimeter to centimeter, the spine. But when you are going here, no problem. No, no plastic in this. So you can easily go for 150 spacing because too much spacing is also sometimes detrimental. But if the 
experienced filing contractors might use even two. But too much uh, space is also detrimental because uh, when you are doing the piling operation, you need a strong reinforcement cage. So the piling operators, uh, the piling contractors will tell you whether they can manage with 150 or uh, you can you can allow you to increase it to 200. But at the top of the pile, for about one meter, we need to have high degree of confinement by having 10 millimeter bars at 100 center center. Uh, on a spiral, because spirals have a huge confining capacity, not like uh, rectangular reinforcement. So the whole idea is by having this confining reinforcement, what we are doing is we are applying a load here, applying a load here, but we are applying a lot these ways also. So there's a spiral to confine. And so when you are when you apply this load, there will be a stress this way, new time sigma. But due to the spiral, there's a huge confinement. So what happens is the behavior of concrete will, will not be like this, that is unconfined. The behavior of concrete will be like this. So you can see there's a huge area under the concrete, stress strain curve, and that gives uh, the ductility. ductility. So in the case of piles, what we need is ductility or ability of the pile to absorb energy. And how we achieve that is not by increasing the vertical reinforcement, but by increasing the confinement. So that's why we like to have T10 spiral at 100 millimeter centers. And if you look at any uh, typical bridge detail, you'll find the engineers have used T10 bars at 100 center to center at the top part of the pile. And that is to make sure the top part of the pile is pile as concrete that is confined a lot so that it will not be, uh, it will not disintegrate easily because there's a huge strength in concrete. When you have a three dimensional stress state, like you know, the way that you do tri triaxial tests in uh, soil mechanics, once you apply the stresses in all directions, all as compressive, then the compressive strength of the concrete, 30 megapascal concrete that you use, will not be 30, it can be 40. And that comes not because the concrete is strong, but the confinement is high. So that's how we prevent earthquake damage on piles. So in Sri Lanka, because it's a low seismic country, piles can be constructed with 0.5% reinforcement onwards. So it's up to the design engineer to decide whether you use 0.6%, 0.7% or 0.8%. So it's totally up to, up to the structural engineer. And uh, again, if you look at uh, piles, so, so because I'm talking about compression members, one of the key compression members will be piles. So what happens is, in the case of a pile, so this is the pile. And if you look, it is subjected to say 7.5 newtons per millimeter squared or 7.5 megapascal stress. So, so one megapascal is equal to seven, one newton per millimeter squared. So what is the stress condition? So we have 7.5. And then if there's a bending moment on it, Generally, you don't get a big bending moment, you get a small bending moment. And then what happens? It will be give a stress diagram like this. So what is the resulting stress diagram? This. Now, these are all in compression. If the whole thing is in compression, why do you need reinforcement? You don't need reinforcement. 
So because of that reason, when you have a long pile, 30 meters, and if the soil is good, laterite, so the confinement is good, there here you can have something like clay sand. So when we when Professor B. L. Denokon taught us piles, he said six meters of rain. But you don't have to be, uh, you can be a little uh, lenient on it. So you might say either 9 meters or 12 meters of rain. Right? And unless your pile is in tension, you, you need only 9 meters or 12 meters of uh, reinforcement. If the pile is, is going into tension, then you will need more. But uh, if the pile is going into tension, there is something wrong with your design. So because of that reason, I will show you later how to deal with this uh, pile going into tension and or how to ensure that the pile does not go into tension. For that, you have to actually work with the architect and make sure the shear walls are loaded. So if the shear wall is loaded, shear wall will never go into tension. If the shear wall doesn't go into tension, you can't have pile going into tension. So you have a wall. Pile cap, piles. If the whole wall is in compression, can you have a situation where the pile is in tension? No. So you have when you are selecting the superstructure, you have to be mindful about the pile foundation and pillar. So I am explaining these things today with piles, which is uh, which is a topic generally we teach at last is. Uh, you can clearly see pile is a member in column in compression, subject to a very small bending moment. Then you might ask, okay, why, why the pile is subjected to a small bending moment? The reason is pile is connected with the pile cap, and then there will be ground beams above the pile cap. So this is the ground beam. So when you connect, when you have a very heavy member at the top as a beam, then the pile will be subjected to very small bending moments. And I will later show you these piles can easily take any moment up to 500 kilo newton meters. Or it can be, it can go up to about 800 kilo newton meters. If the pile diameter is about 1 or 1.2 meters, the pile can easily take bending moment of uh, 800 kilonewton meters when you provide minimum of 0.5 percent weight. So as long as piles are concerned, if somebody says we need a lot of reinforcement, it is wrong. We need some reinforcement to uh, make sure the piling, uh, the, the reinforcement used the cage, the reinforcement cage that we use is strong enough to be handled because we have to lift it, lower it, we are doing a lot of things and uh, because the reinforcement is not that important and because and also because we are using QST reinforcement, what we call QT bars, quenched and self-tempered, these bars can be welded without losing strength. So you can use welding. And make sure the cage is strong. The reason is, you know, the reinforcement is not important. We need some reinforcement as a precaution measure. But piles are very, piles have a very high moment capacity, arising due to the fact pile is in compression. So in that case, what is important when you are constructing a pile? What is important is verticality. What is important is vertical. So that's the place where you need attention. Not on, uh, you know, how you place the reinforcement case or what. So what is important is vertical. So when you are doing the piling, pay maximum attention to assure that the pile is cast vertical. That is it.
So that's why we recommend uh, the use of uh, temporary casing in the top part of the pipe so that we'll have a better control if the soil is weak. If the soil is weak, we strongly recommend the use of uh, temporary casing and uh, most of the piling contractors might say, oh, we can easily do six meters of temporary casing. And uh, generally they, they are very comfortable with eight meters of temporary casing. With some little difficulty, they can go up to about 10 or 12 meters. But uh, I prefer something range like eight meters because when the temporary casing is withdrawn, if the soil is very weak, I would like about eight meters, but if the soil is strong, but uh, you know you you are you want to minimize the bulging and uh, withdraw, you know have a temporary casing, then you can even go up to ten or twelve meters. But if the soil is weak, then uh, you know when you are withdrawing, the concrete may not have enough strength to hold it properly. So because of all these reasons. Six to eight meters of temporary casing is uh, highly recommended in weak soil conditions. Whereas in stronger soil conditions, uh, where the SPT values are low, but they are not extremely low, then you can have even 10 or 12 meters of uh, temporary casing. The whole idea is by the time the casing is withdrawn, concrete should have sufficient strength to hold it on its own. So. If the soil is extremely weak, then better to make it shorter because the reason is the weight of the concrete in the shaft. But whereas if it is a reasonable soil, but you like to have like clay soils where you like to have some confinement to ensure that uh, the amount of extra concrete needed due to bulging can be kept as low as possible, uh, then you can even go for up to 12 meters of temporary casing or it can be even some situations with little difficulty pile cleaning contractors might agree okay i'll do 14 meters of temporary casing but generally 12 is the range uh, that we generally consider as maximum so these are very important practical information because we are talking about a column and one classic application of a column is a pipe so and in pile, there are a lot of uh, opinions because we can't, we don't, we don't see the pile. So, but how we make a good high quality pile is using temporary casings. And the moment you use a temporary casing in the upper part, which can be subjected to moment, what we need is a kind of a minimum reinforcement of about 0.5%. But uh, it's customary in Sri Lanka to use 0 0.6, 0 0.7 to 0.8% uh, reinforcement in the top part of the uh, pile because uh, the reinforcement cage also needs some stiffness. And the most important thing in the pile is having a spiral providing confinement to concrete at the top part because uh, we like to have triacial stress state to assure that concrete will not crush under earthquake situations. And then as we go, after about 9 meters or 12 meters, the theoretically you don't need reinforcement. If you are providing any reinforcement, provide only 0.5%. Because anything more is useless. You are not going to gain anything by providing more, more reinforcement. And also, the other important thing is, If you are curtailing the reinforcement, you are not going to lose anything. And I can tell you, the tallest building in Sri Lanka, that is Altair, Twin Towers, 168 floors, 164 floors, the length of the reinforcement cage is only 12 meters. The length of the reinforcement cage is only 12 meters because it has good sandy soil or weathered soil, uh, weathered rock, about highly fractured rock. So, in the highly fractured rock, the original design was key to use only one 12 meter length of reinforcement to 
reduce the cost of construction. And uh, I have spoken to many piling experts, real experts. They say the one length of reinforcement, maybe six, nine, or 12, is generally sufficient. And I prefer something like nine to 12 rather than six because, uh, you know, we have to allow for some, uh, uh, you know, moments. Sometimes the moments can be there up to about four meters. Again, the other important thing that you have to keep in mind is in a pile, the moment is, uh, will be only the first three to four meters of the pile. After that, moment is very low value, almost negligible. And with a model on SAP 2000, where I can show you by representing the soil as streams, the bending moment rapidly reduces to a value close to zero. I'll show it later day. And you can remind me when, when we start modeling, or when I start showing you how to do modeling, uh, just remind me how to model the soil when it is sandy and how to model the soil when it is clay. So I will show you all these different variations. But uh, keep in mind that uh, the bending moment in a pile uh, su supporting, supported, supporting a pile cap and when the ground beam is present, generally the moment vanishes to a value close to zero within three to four meters. So that is some very useful information. And that is the area that we need extra confinement that we provide by having a spiral at close spacing, like 100 millimeter, but we can relax it as we go down. And then even if you don't have any reinforcement, nothing will happen because it's like a pre-stressed concrete member having a high stress. So for all this to happen, the most important consideration is pile must be as vertical as possible. Pile should not be inclined, but these days are uh, in Sri Lanka, most of the contractors use BG24, BG25, 26, 28, 30 type machines. And those machines are very hardy machines. And they these machines, the uh, experienced operators can very easily maintain the verticality. So they are, they are used to it. So the risks are low because we have good operators and also piling contractors also, uh, you know, these machines are very versatile machines, high, cap high capacity machines. So it's possible that, uh, you know, we can easily construct a pile which is vertical. So verticality is important, but we can actually make it vertical. So, there is some extra information, and you might ask why I talk about piling. Uh, the reason is, you know, now gradually we are coming out of the kind of a very serious situation in the country. And uh, so when you are, the first thing that will happen is piling. But because we are coming out of a downturn, the material costs are very high. So everything must be saved. So the first thing that we can save money is piling. And we must make sure that we know the theory well. And the theory is, it's a column. And a column subject to uniform stress is like a pre-stress pumping member, very strong in carrying flexure. So we don't need reinforcement to carry flexural moments in a pile. Two reasons. One is the bending moments will vanish in the first three to four meters of the length. Secondly, in a pre-stressed member, even without reinforcement, it can carry a big bending moment provided the pile is vertical. So those are the reasons. Panduka, is that clear? Yes, sir. That is clear. Sorry, yes. It's clear. Very clear. Yeah, it's clear. Right. Good. So, so basically, by using, you know, showing a small example of how to design a column, now we have gone, uh, I have provided a lot of information, 
on piling because any new project, the first thing is piling. So think about uh, optimizing the piling by using all these different methods, right? So now we'll, uh, uh, so we have this equation. Now let's see how we get the same equation in Eurocode, the comparable equation in Eurocode. The comparable equation in Europe. So now I'm going to do this, derive the same equation using Europe. Is it okay? Yes, uh, so yes, sir. Please continue. Please okay. continue, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. If you have any difficulty in uh, hearing or anything, please let me know. Okay. Sir. Right. Okay. So now, Eurocode, C25, 30. So earlier we are talking about 30 megapascal concrete. Now we are using cylinders, three, uh, 150 millimeter circular, 300 millimeter. And we place it under the platelets. And so here no confinement. So what you get is actual strength. So what you get as strength is actual strength. Then we have to say, okay, now we have we test this way. We use this way. So we have to need it 0.85. And then we need 1.5 partial. Factor of safety, right? Partial factor of safety. And as engineers, you should never say factor of safety. It's partial factor of safety. The reason is if factor of safety means overall factor of safety. But we are not we are not having an overall factor of safety. We are putting the factor of safety only on the material, so it has to be partial. It's very important that the engineers use the correct terminology. What is the answer? 0.567. So, if you are using Euro code, N is equal to 0.567. FCK, now in Euro code, uh, the, Q, the, the cylinder strength is FCK multiplied by area of concrete plus uh, 0.87 FY K AC. So you can write, use any notation that you like. But uh, if you look at Euro code, you know, it's using FCK, YK and all those notations. Now, 10% reduction. So 10% reduction is uh, 0.567 multiplied by 0.9. So it's, you can say 0.5 FCK AC plus uh, 0.75 FYK AC. And if you want, you can have a further 10% reduction. So multiplied by 0.9 again. So you get 0.45 FCK AC plus 0.67 FYK AC. So I get an equation like that. So even under Euro code, code doesn't give the equation, whereas BS code gives the equation. So we can use BS code approach where the you have a beam supported by a column, and this side seven meters, this side six meters. So what is the difference? Six divided by uh, seven. So it is 15% difference. So the chances are that the moments are very small. So if you are in a hurry, you don't have access to a chart. The spans are almost equal. Just use this equation and find the reinforcement. So for example, uh, 
let's say we have a column that we expect. Uh, so this is how you work it out. Generally, say we have a little easier question. Uh, so we have one way steps and this side seven meters, this side six meters. And here you get a column. So the steps are like that, right? So the load on the beam is from this place to this place. That's the load on the beam. And uh, so we like to get the loading on the uh, column. And uh, so how do you find the loading on the column? These seven meters, six meters on this side. So we have to find 1.35 UK plus 1.5 UK to find the load. So there are some magic numbers for this. For a house, this value is 8. For a house. Then for an office building, uh, light, uh, you know, Office building, it can be 10 to 11 kilonewtons per meter square for an office building. And if it is an, uh, you know, uh, an auditorium, we say about 13 kilonewtons per meter square, auditorium. Now, what is the, what is the value of these numbers? Now, you know, I don't do any calculation. Let's say this is an office bill. So I simply use 11 kilonewtons per meter square. So 11 into 3.5 plus uh, 11 into 6, 11 into 3. That is a lot. 11 into 3.5, but uh, this way we we'll say these beams are at 4 meters. So we have to multiply it by 4. We also multiply by 4. So the load from the flow will be, now I have not done any calculation because I have some rules of thumb. So for an office building, I expect the design load to be around 11 kilonewtons per meter square. For, but, but for a house, I would expect something like 8 to 9. And uh, this will include the weight of the beam as well. So when you use these numbers, so what I do is I don't do any calculation to find the exact loading because I know some numbers and straight away I, I find the beams are spaced as 4 meters. So 4 meters of load will come onto this and the load is 11 and so the load on the beam is 44 kilonewtons per meter over length of 3.5 meters because there's a span of 7 meters. So I get 154 here and 11 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 4. So I get 132 from this side. So the load is 154 uh, plus 132. So from this low, low flow, I'm getting a load of 286. 286 and uh, let's say I'm doing a 10 story building having a grid like this the grid is uh, on one side you get 7 meters the other the eight spans are 6 meters and uh, the beams are located every 4 meters and uh, they are being uh, designed as uh, one less one less so just to just to make things simpler right but they say they are they have been designed as uh, one meter slabs because and some other places you will get eight meter spans as well. So the design has decided okay, I'm going to design everything as one way. Six, seven. Right. So now 286 load comes from one floor. And let's say we are in a 10 story building. And uh, so there are 10 floors. And we are going to design the most critically loaded one. So there are nine floors above. And I'm going to design the column at the ground level. So nine floors above means 286 into nine is the load from above. And that gives 
into 9, 2574 kilonewtons. So I have to find the reinforcement for carrying 2574. But you can see the bending moments is so very small <coughs> because both sides are fully loaded. Both sides are fully loaded. So if both sides are fully loaded, the columns will cancel out at the uh, column. So I'm going to say, okay, the, lo the load on the column is 2,574 kilonewtons. Now comes the important question. Right. What is the size of the column that we need? Now, would it be, would it depend on axial load or earthquake resistance? Which is governed? This or this? Or both? Yes, it's both. But the earthquake resistance is more important. So you can see we are having spans like 7 meters. So what is the section of the column? Beam. So section is likely to be 300, 600 by 350. 350 is to make sure that uh, there's enough width in the beam to place the reinforcement. So I don't generally like very thin beams unless there's a special reason to do so. I like, uh, you know, fairly wide beams, like 300 or 350 wide beams. I don't like 250 wide beams. It was very difficult to do the construction. And we need little, uh, and anyway, beam is an important member. Why, why do you want to make it so thin? If you want to make something thin, what is the member that you will use? Slabs. You will try and make slabs th as thin as possible, but you will be generous with the pumps. So if this is the case, what is the minimum size of the column that you use? Minimum size of the column is has to be 500 by 500. Or preferably even larger, 600 by 600. Why? That's where the earthquake resistance is. So we have this, every flow, these beams, uh, the beams, and columns. Now, in a portal frame, where do you get the hinges from? We come in. Or it could be here. Which is better? This is A, this is B. Which, which hinge is better? B is better. Why? If the hinges form on columns, columns can give away. Give away. That means they can just be flattened. The whole building will be flat, flattened by the way. But if the hinges are forming in the beam, then it will convert the continuous beam to a simply supported beam. Now, can you have a uh, multi story building with simply supported beams? Yes. I mean, there are certain car parks where they have used precast beams and, and the beams are simply supported. <coughs> we don't have any problem. So, what it says is we can have. the precast uh, beams and make it uh, simply supported. So, if you have a plastic king forming in the beam, it will convert the continuous beam to a simply supported one after a certain moment. So, we like all the hinges forming where? We like all the hinges coming in the beam and we know the weaker, weaker member will be forming the forming the hinges. So where do you like? What is the size you like? You like a column larger than the you like a column larger than the So let's assume based on this information we have selected a 600, 500 by 500 column because 500 by 500 column is uh, fairly large and it is larger than uh, 600 by 300 B. So the hinges will definitely form on the uh, on the column or on the beams. So now we have a 
column size. Now, can you see how I arrived at the column size? It is not based on uh, the carrying capacity. It is based on the earthquake system. So I have a column now having 500 by 500 carrying a load of 2,574 kilonewtons. And so I say N is equal to point, uh, the equation is point, Four five FCK AC plus point six seven FYK AC. So I'm going to say I'm not going to find any reinforcement. So I'm going to say two thousand five hundred seventy four into ten to the power three is equal to point four five multiplied by twenty five, and that is A minus. ASC plus 0.67 times 500 is the strength of steel multiplied by ASC. And A is 500 by 500. So we are interested in finding the amount of reinforcement. So we are going to say 2574 into the power 3 minus 0.45 into 25 into 500 by 500 because now the column size has been selected based on the earthquake criterion and that is uh, equal to 0.67 multiplied by 500 minus 0.45 times 25 times SAC and from this you can get the answer so the answer is uh, we get AC as sometimes I might get a negative value, that means I don't need reinforcement. That can happen, then I provide the minimum reinforcement, or because these are 10 story building, I'll provide 1% reinforcement. So we get 2574 minus 0.45 into 25 multiplied by. 500 multiplied by 500 and as I told you, I'm getting a negative answer. Divided by whatever comes here, it doesn't matter. So I, I will calculate that also. 0 0.67 multiplied by 500 minus 0 0.45 multiplied by 25. So that is uh, 323.7. I'm getting a negative answer. That means no design no design reinforcement. But because it is a 10 story building, I'm going to find 1% reinforcement. That means 500 into 500 into 500 into 500 into, 500 into 0.01. So the reinforcement will be 500 into 500 into 0.01. So I get 2,500 millimeters squared of reinforcement. So the, the amount of reinforcement, I'm providing 1% reinforcement because that's a heavily loaded uh, column because we are designing a column in the 10-story building. So what I do is I will See, so if I'm going to use 16 millimeter bars, the area is 201. So I can, what I can do is I can divide this by 201. And I will need uh, about uh, 14 bars. And uh, because I'm deliberately providing, I can even provide 12 bars. Slightly less than 1%, but it's okay, very close to 1%. So what I can do is 16 millimeter bars. I need 12 bars. So if I provide 4 on one side, 4 on the other side, 8, and I can provide 2 there, 2 there. Right. Now comes the important question. Now we are concerned about earthquake resistance. And how do we assure ductility in this piece, in this one? 
how do you assure that thing? So the hinges again, if they ever form, now we have made sure the hinges will not form. But if a hinge ever forms, where would it form? There. Hinge will form there. So how can I how could I make it uh, strong? So what I do is I will have one link going right round and eight millimeter diameter. We call it now. Now it is H8, not not T8, H8, because we are dealing with Eurocode. So the moment you are dealing with Eurocode, you have to change the numbers. And I will provide one link here and another link here. So that is the arrangement. Why? I like confinement for concrete. The best way to provide confinement for concrete uh, uh, so there are some comments so I will answer those again. So basically I like to have confinement. Why? Confinement can so we confine the concrete in all directions, the strength is very high. Strength is very high. So we confine the concrete. So we provide something like 100 millimeter center to center H8 bars for about 0.6 meters. Then I relax it to about 12 times diameters. For about another one meter. And the remaining part I can go up to 20 times that. Because there's no way the center of the column can fail. So I can go up to about 20 times that. But the I like something like 100 millimeter center to center at the top, at the bottom, over a length of about 0.6 meters. And the other important thing I like is. I like these are reinforcement, some additional reinforcement in the column going in both, both directions within the beam so that inside the beam also we have some kind of confinement. Otherwise what happens is this is perfect but it fails here. It fails here. To prevent that failure what we do is we have a junction. So we we'll provide some reinforcement because this is the beam reinforcement anyway. There will be other reinforcement going that way. But within the middle portion, because this can be about 600 millimeters deep, in the middle, we'll have some additional reinforcement going like that. And those are just uh, maybe 12 millimeter bars. Uh, you don't need 16 millimeter bars, just 12 millimeter bars. Why? The moment you put some reinforcement inside the joint, any kind of stress reversal that occurs during an earthquake can be easily resisted. So, what we do is we, we use H8 bars, then we use H12 bars in the middle of the joint so that uh, you know those are additional bars uh, you know tied to the side of the beam. So, beam is like this we have some top bars, uh, bottom bars, and we we'll have some side bars like this and some side bars going like this. So the idea is you know we need we need better confinement. We need better confinement. So what we do is we provide this additional bars of 12 millimeter H12 and uh, create a situation where the joint inside the joint also we have range. Not at the at the outer boundaries of the joint. Inside the joint also we have some Nominal reinforcement and these nominal reinforcements can ensure a building detailed display in Sri Lanka will never suffer any damage in an earthquake. That's the way that we can prevent because what we are doing is by confining the concrete, we are increasing the increasing the strength of concrete. So when the, the biggest problem in an earthquake is this concrete disintegrate. So the biggest problem is this will break because this will be subject to tension. Those will break into 
small pieces and to, not to the aggregate level but bigger pieces and the moment the concrete crush is crushed by breaking into bigger pieces this crushing occurs not due to concrete compression but due to tension so to prevent those tension in concrete so first thing is we we enhance the confinement so the so the tensile stresses would be lower and uh, also we'll make sure within the joint also we do we enhance this confinement or we provide some flexural mechanism that can carry any kind of tension so the whole idea is improve the ducting improve the ducting the ductile structure cannot suffer significant damage during a 20 second earthquake now what why do i say that why do i say 20 second earthquake so the reason is 7 8 we are not in a plate bound area so the energy uh, absorbed will be small and uh, now here you have the ring of fire the energy is massive so the earthquake can last one sec one minute to five minutes those are massive earthquakes but here we are within the plate this is over 1000 miles 1000 kilometers away ring of fire is about 1400 kilometers away so so whatever happens there can create a tsunami but not not a, not a, not felt by tsunami but what we get is intraplate and uh, our faults are not significant enough to create a earthquake lasting more than 20 seconds so if you look at the uh, natural period of vibration of vibration of a 10 story building is 1 second so how many how many cycles that the building will undergo before the earthquake ends maximum of 20 sometimes it can be even less because even 20 second is sometimes it is too on the high side nothing is more than 20 seconds can occur maximum is around 20 seconds so we are going to have about 20 cycles and if i having only 20 cycles can this ever suffer damage no because we have huge confinement in the regions where we need so that's what, how we should approach the earthquake resistance in buildings by selecting large enough columns confining the plastic in just to beams even within beams we do the detailing like this again on the column we don't like we hate hinges so we try confinement but in the beam also or 0.6 meters on either side we have confined in reinforcement so the usual detail i like is t8 so h8 at 75 h8 at 75 center center in respect of the requirement of the hinges whatever the shear links need space 100 125 but i still provide same over length of 0.6 meters then i provide this additional bars within this region so that will provide the strain needed within the joint to resist tension and i will, i have confinement here also and this type of detailing will do huge ductility to the structure and the ductile structures can easily withstand earthquakes so this is how we make reinforced concrete buildings in sri lanka earthquake resistant and sometimes you might say okay why don't we do some calculations and find some because you can never ever consider the total load uh, and 
designed for an earthquake because the total load can be massive. So how we actually resist earthquakes is not by designing for a force, but by dissipating the energy. To dissipate the energy without suffering any damage, there should be need huge amount of ductility. So when you are using reinforced concrete, uh, you can see it's very easy to find the reinforcement in a column. But what matters is not your direct calculation. What matters is how much ductility you are providing in the structure. And also, how you have assessed the risk of failure. So, what is the advantage of providing this kind of, uh, the kind of reinforcement detail I showed you? Now, you know, these uh, in a 10 story building, first two floors can be car parking. So, if a car ram onto this column, if it is 500 by 500 or 600 by 600, can anything happen to the column? The answer is no. Column has been, you, you have used uh, C2530 concrete, so that is cylinder strength 25 concrete. You have cured it, you have put some 10% uh, fly ash into it. So finally, the strength of the column can be 45 megapascal one day. And uh, car crash onto this. Car will be a wreck, but building will not feel anything. Very safe. And another day, earthquake strikes. There's huge amount of confinement in the columns. So columns cannot anyway form hinges because columns are bigger than beams. So beams might form one or two hinges, but it doesn't matter. Why? When you are designing a beam in an earthquake resistant structure, we know there's a possibility for hinges to occur here and here during an earthquake. So what we do is, what we do is, if the hinges form, what happens to the bending moment diagram? Now bending moment diagram comes like this, and it says, okay, now this is, beyond this I am not increasing. So any idea, extra load will come here. So what we do is when you are providing reinforcement, we provide some little extra reinforcement in the beam. The moment you provide some little extra reinforcement in the beam, bottom, bottom street, even if the hinge occurs in the beam, still the beam can never collapse because it has a huge capacity at the most critical section, that is the span section. So when you are detailing, what we do is, we go for this. When you are detailed in the beam, what we do is we use some hanger bars, provides extra reinforcement here, provide extra reinforcement here, but only marginal. Don't provide any extra because there's no point in providing extra. Then we provide extra reinforcement. And here we provide actually extra. So when you know, need uh, four numbers of H20, we might provide two H20 plus two H25. We will be a little generous in providing reinforcement because the moment you do this, you can minimize the reinforcement everywhere else except in the spam. Knowing very well, beam is going to fail. If it ever fails, it will fail at the center. Now I'm going to provide extra reinforcement to prevent this failure at the center. So this is how you are to look at reinforced concrete design. But I'm sure most of you would have mechanically done it without understanding what's going on. So you have a bending moment, you refer a chart or do a calculation, provide the reinforcement, and you provide a little extra, you don't know why what's going on in the structure. But this is how the structure is going to behave when it is subject to dynamic loads. Static loads are not, uh, not important because uh, the dynamic loads are more critical. And so you have to look at the dynamic behavior of the structure and decide how you are going to do the detail. So with that, Manuka, shall I uh, stop the lecture? And I can answer whatever the questions in the yeah. chat box. There are uh, several questions. Uh, 
Yeah, can you ask? Can you read them? Sure, sure, sir. Uh, what will be the adverse effects if rainwater accumulated on fresh concrete and during curing, curing period? No, it, there's no effect because uh, what matters is this, this huge, there will be huge amount of calcium hydroxide produced. So, rainwater can have only uh, what you call uh, carbonic acid and it will be neutralized in no time. Okay. So there's, a, there's no acidic effect of rainwater because when you when you, rainwater is even good because it has no chlorine. Okay, Bandhu. Yeah. Okay, sir. And also he has asked another question: uh, How can uh, explain it the minimum time duration to start curing with water after casting? No, actually the most important thing is uh, we are in a tropical climate. So, so you have to protect the newly laid concrete from direct sunlight. Your direct sunlight can uh, evaporate the water very fast. And if the water evaporates too fast, you will get plastics in the expense. So you must make sure either you start completing around 5 o'clock in the evening so that no, no, no direct solar radiation on it. Otherwise, you have to cover it. But after around 15 to 20 hours, you can start curing. Because the moment the water is not absorbed, you can start curing. Okay, sir. The, the um, maximum duration is 24 hours. Before 24 hours, you must start curing. Okay, sir. Basically, before the sun rises next day, you must start curing. Okay, sir. Because, you know, the moment sun rises, you know, it's gone. Sunrise means you intense uh, uh, solar radiation, around 800 watts per square meter. So if, if you allow the water to evaporate, very difficult to get it in. So you must ensure whatever the water that you have used in uh, concrete, it remains within concrete. So that's the criteria. So by looking at the uh, climatic conditions, you have to decide when to start curing. But uh, these modern cements, uh, you know, allow you to start curing after 12 hours. Okay, Vandu. Okay, sir. And uh, okay. the other question is, uh, how we can ensure the skin friction of the soil on the pile if we use temporary steel encasement? Oh, no, no. You don't have to worry because soil has a habit of uh, settling, uh, you know, recovering. Because, you know, when you do a pile, you use bentonite and you, you, you do everything. Skin friction is low at, in the initial stage. But if you allow two months, the soil has the habit of regaining its uh, lost capacities and then you will find the skin friction is very high. So we don't have to worry about it. Okay, we can withdraw the casing and soil will automatically do the rest. We don't okay. have to worry about it. Okay, sir. And uh, again, uh, another participant has shared his experience. Uh, he yeah. has experienced some high uh, high class bungalow house, three story building with basement, where column yeah. sizes are 250 into 100 and 250 into 1000. And long span beam sizes are 300 into 700. In this case, yeah. can we expect hinges from in the beam? Like no, actually, actually, if it is a three-story building with such massive columns and beams, hinges will never ever form. You can see it's out of proportion. Is that right? They are massive. Yes. So if they are massive, the members are massive, then the plastic hinges will not form because the structure itself has a huge capacity. They are like shear walls. 1000 meters long and uh, millimeters long and 20 to 150 wide. It's not a, it's not a, it's, it's on the margin of a column. Because anything more, say 1200 by 250, then it's a wall. It has to be designed like a wall. So, so, so nothing can go wrong in that subject. Okay, sir. And uh, another question uh, I have seen some column reinforcement details such a way that there are four vertical reinforcement in the core of the column. What would be the reason for that? No, actually, in that case, the it's not a detail that we keep. But some engineers, you know, uh, 
due to many there are some reasons like you know now you see let's say you are going to have priestess uh, in the beams so priestess can move the column so what so one of the things we do is you know when you, when you have a 600 by 600 column supporting a massive span say 20 meter span using a priestess beam what we do is we put the reinforcement on the edges but we put another core inside because uh, what happens is uh, the there will be some cracks forming uh, because when you are doing the pre-stressing, there will be axial shortening. So that will start dragging the column. So in that case, you will have a core where you will have extra capacity. So that's a, it may be that type of situation. Otherwise, there is absolutely no reason to provide uh, uh, reinforcement in the core of a column. Okay? Oh, sir. Uh, sir, um, I'm Mangala here. I just want to yeah. ask this additional question. I mean, the the what you said uh, regarding the reinforcement inside the, uh, the it's something like a core of the column. Is there yeah. any any guideline of calculating that type of thing, or is it by just a practice? So no, 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 no. It's it's the, basically you will look at the uh, axial shortening and what is the moment induced. Right? Okay. So for okay. that, you will put a small diameter bars on the outer. Okay. So that the cracks will be distributed. Cannot be seen. But uh, if you need any moment capacity, then you will make sure inside the vehicle, the, 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 the reinforcement inside it can provide the adequate uh, moment capacity. Right? It's a very special case. One. The only the come uh, occur. When you do uh, what you call uh, pre-stress, pre-stressing in beams and slabs, you have to be a little careful of this, uh, you know, column being dragged by the pre-stress. So sometimes we, we we do the, we don't do pre-stressing around the column, but we do pre-stressing everywhere else and then we uh, connect the, fill the gap with reinforce, reinforcement. So there are so many different techniques, but this is a very special case. There's another question. I saw something just yes. typed. Yeah. What is that? Um, uh, what is the minimum requirement for tidying sizing for a building with a uh, ground floor plus one floor structure arrangement? Where are the tie beams so, are supported? Tie beam, yeah, tie beam. Yeah. What you can do is, uh, you know, there's a simple equation to calculate the uh, base shear. Right? And base shear means... Uh, you, if you consider a particular uh, earthquake magnitude, something like, uh, you know, if you are using Australian code, you can say acceleration coefficient of 0 0.08. 0 0.08, which is the value recommended for Sydney. So we can't have any earthquake bigger than the earthquake in Sydney. So we calculate the ground, the base shear. And we have to make sure the reinforcement provided can take this base shear. Then there will not be any distinctions. That's all. So generally, when you do this calculation, you will find two numbers of 10 millimeter diameters. Bars in uh, the foundation level is enough. But you know, you can't provide. So you can provide a simple type. You no, know, nothing. Uh, the moment you have two numbers of strain, most of the buildings you will find uh, it is sufficient to uh, ensure that the whole foundation moves in one direction. During an earthquake, because the whole base shear will be less uh, less than the uh, total tension 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 tensile capacity of all H N bars, because you will have a number of beams in one direction, another number of beams in the other direction. So my experience is two numbers of H N is more than enough in a small building, like a two-story or three-story house, and I might even use uh, two uh, numbers of H A. Even H A is enough. To make sure the foundation never descends. It's a small building. But in a bigger building, you can calculate the base shear and see how much reinforcement is needed in the anyway. In a big building, the most likely case is you will have a ground slab, reinforced concrete ground slab. In such a scenario, say 10 story building, most likely case is even the ground slab will be a reinforced concrete. Because, right? So in such a scenario, uh, you might not provide one layer of reinforcement, you might provide two layers of reinforcement. At the ground slab with a small diameter bars, then you don't have to worry. The whole thing will, the whole building will behave as one entity. Is that clear, one, Google? Yes, sir. 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 Yes, sir.
Yeah, yes, that is clear. You have to design that I beam, you have to look at the base sheet. Okay, sir. There's a simple and... equation. Uh, we have to take account of the, the soil type. Uh, that is the early equation. Or oh, otherwise, you can calculate the base shear for Australian code or whatever, Euro code or whatever the code and make sure the in one direction base shear can be taken by uh, reinforcement going into tension. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. And uh, another question is related to tie beams. Uh, don't we consider the differential settlements of foundations when designing a no, tie beam? You know, the differential settlements cannot occur. If you properly design the foundation, differential segments cannot occur. What is the reason? Now, let's say we are in a laterite soil area. We are told, uh, the geotechnical engineer says, okay, you can use 200 kilonewtons per meter square. Now, what is the meaning of this 200 kilonewtons per meter square? When you apply 200 kilonewtons or 20 tons over one square meter, it, the soil is going to have an elastic deformation of 25 millimeters. And you have to say, we are in Sri Lanka. Laterite soil, will it ever settle after that? No. Laterite soil is hugely strong soil. The bearing capacity can be, at ultimate, can be 700, 800. Why we apply 200 is to make sure the settled elastic deformation is 25. So if you do a proper foundation, the differential settlement is zero. But there is a place where the differential settlement can occur. And that is clay, clay sand or sandy clay. It's all clay soils. In such situations, we don't use isolated pudding. What we do is we go for inverted T-type foundations placed on ABC fill. And the moment you have a, such a strong foundation, differential settlements are against you. So you don't have to worry about differential settlements in Sri Lanka if you, have, if you properly design the structures. Or you have good soil. If you have good soil, no differential settlement. If you have weak soil, we make sure differential settlement is zero because we put the whole thing on the inverted T. Okay. Okay, sir. I'll show you how to do the modeling on Mezzona. All those things I can show you. And uh, the, I, I shared some set of notes. Uh, those notes have all those uh, uh, calculations because that's a not set of notes specifically prepared for foundation. So you at least go through the notes and you can learn a lot from this. Yes, sir. We have shared it uh, with the yeah. group. With the group, mm -hmm. right? So so just ask yeah. them to go through the notes. Those notes are actually uh, for MSc in Geotechnical Engineering. And you can learn a lot from, from those notes. Uh, so, so basically, uh, the idea is to go through the notes. And uh, in Sri Lanka, you can't have differentials. If you have properly designed the foundations, if it is uh, even if it is isolated footings on laterite soil, no, no differential settlement. If it is a weak soil, you we, we because they can be different elements, you put the whole thing on indirect, very stiff foundation, then again you can't have differential settlements. Is that clear, Vandugan? Yes, sir, that is clear. Uh, seems like the questions are over for now, sir. Yeah, okay, so shall then we'll wind up. Okay, sir. And uh, I would like to. Uh, okay, uh, someone has asked to share the notes. Uh, actually, uh, we are sharing the notes uh, in our WhatsApp group. Uh, someone has put the email address. Uh, we'll share to that also. Okay. Yes. And uh, we are uh, thankful to Professor Tisanjay Singh for conducting this lecture series. Actually, this lecture series has become very interesting among practicing engineers. Most of the questions they arise and uh, they are getting cleared on them. So this has become a very interesting lecture series for all practicing engineers. Thank you very much for sharing yeah, your you. knowledge on that. And also I would like to thank the chairman, uh, civil engineering section committee engineer Mangana, Mangala Silva for initiating this uh, timely lecture series uh, for this year. Thank you very much, sir. And also I would like to thank the ISS secretariat IT department and the publicity department for hosting facilities for this lecture series. And also more importantly, I would like to thank all the participants, uh, your uh, enthusiasm and uh, interest on the subject and questions, all these things make this lecture series a success. 
so uh, our like next next lecture will be on next uh, wednesday at uh, 7 pm that is uh, 20th is that right 20th. yes that is 20th are we conducting 20th. on 27th as well yeah, so? we'll, we will conduct yeah 27th okay. yeah i will let you know so generally okay. i have kept all wednesdays free okay but sir. because it's this family conference is coming and there are so many things happening yes. uh, so 27th is also a possibility but if okay. there's any change uh, we'll inform them okay sir okay and but, but i have put all 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 wednesdays free generally okay thank you very much sir for that I don't and accept any appointment on Wednesdays. Uh, okay. Only during the time, uh, uh, after four, no appointment. So, generally, I will, I will keep all Wednesdays free so we can continue. Okay. Thank, thank you. you thank much. you very much, sir, for <laughs> I mean, for your dedication. Thank you very much. On behalf of Sailing and Sexual Men, I would like to say thank you again. Thank you, Professor, right. and okay. thank you, Bandura. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to leave. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Good night.